Now we are online on YouTube also, and uh, let's begin with our main poster here. So, right. Ah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, another question. Yes. Dear Vice Rector for Academic and Student Affairs, Professor Dimitris Karadimas, esteemed colleagues, dear students, dear colleagues online, dear students online, dear friends online, I wish to welcome you all to Athens on behalf of the organizing committee. It is a great pleasure for me to address you, offering a welcoming note as an introduction to our international workshop on Xenos here at the School of Theology that our Department of Social Theology and the Study of Religion organizes together with the Department of Global Humanities and the Stavros Nyarko Center for Hellenic Studies of Simon Fraser University, Vancouver, Canada, for the first time. The topic of the workshop is Xenos, the stranger, the other, the foreigner, the refugee, which is a thematic interdisciplinary issue with multiple meanings. It is a word which comes from the ancient times and has a diachronic continuity. This word is as old as the world. It appears in ancient Greek mythology in the Homeric epics. The word stranger has a significant meaning and is connected with hospitality and with Zeus, Xenios Dias, the god of guests. The word Xenia in Greek translates to the custom of offering protection and hospitality to strangers, and it is seen mostly through Homer's Odyssey. But it is not only in Homer, but also in the Bible that the word stranger appears and affirms strongly the obligation to treat strangers with dignity and hospitality. Of course, the Israelites themselves were strangers during their enslavement in Egypt and captivity in Babylon. The Bible recognizes that every one of us can be a stranger, and for that very reason, we need to overcome our fear of those who live among us whom we do not know. In the New Testament, the value of welcome and generosity to the stranger and to the foreigner are reflected in the book of Matthew. I quote, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me, end of quote. For Christians, a grudging or discriminatory approach for the stranger is completely unacceptable. In modern times, we encounter the term or its meanings reflecting on contemporary historical events, such as the Asia Minor disaster, explored further in many literary texts. Novelists such as Elias Venezis and Vivo Sotiriu have reflected in their prose pieces the refugee issue, among other writers. 
And it is obvious that the word foreigner, stranger, which concerns every society, is beyond national identity, race, or religion. And it is not a threat for the other, it's not a rival or an enemy, but the opposite. It is connected with acceptance, indifference, and solidarity. This is the topic of our diverse workshop with its various meanings and different aspects. Participants from National and Capodistrian University of Athens and Simon Fraser University will give us an idea of treating the topic from different disciplines such as theology, history, literature, bioethics, and others. I believe that this Hellenic Canadian workshop will be the beginning of further fruitful academic discussions on various issues. I hope that we will have a productive interdisciplinary workshop. And now I would like to invite the Vice Rector for Academic and Student Affairs, Professor Dimitris Karadimas, to offer his welcome note. Dear colleagues, uh, dear friends, dear uh, students, uh, I'm very happy uh, and I thank uh, for this uh, uh, Professor uh, Kefalea uh, for uh, inviting me and uh, giving me the opportunity to be here among you today and uh, welcome you to Athens and to our university. Uh, as you probably know, our university is uh, the oldest uh, university, uh, the oldest institution of higher education in the Balkans and the Eastern Mediterranean area. Uh, very soon, uh, it's going to uh, complete uh, 200 years of uh, life, uh, and uh, uh, it's always committed, this is what we are trying to do, committed uh, to excellence in uh, both uh, pillars, uh, teaching and uh, research. Uh, it has a meaning, uh, I suppose, to, 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 to tell you that uh, our university has uh, about 2,000 uh, teaching staff, uh, 1,000 uh, uh, administrative and uh, technical uh, uh, personnel in various uh, specialities, specializations, uh, and uh, about 70,000 students. And uh, uh, we cover uh, a significantly, significantly varied range of, uh, of disciplines. And uh, having said this, uh, uh, I have to, to, to repeat that uh, I'm truly pleased that our university, uh, through the Department of Social Theology and uh, the Study of Religion and the Simon Fraser University of Canada, with its Stavros Narcos Center for Hellenic Studies of the Global Humanities Department, have joined forces to launch a brilliant interdisciplinary initiative for senior and uh, young researchers to meet and explore subjects on the top of uh, world's uh, agenda. The workshop on Xenos, on the is in Straits Other is an international academic event. You have gained a special place in the inspirational opportunities the National and Capodistria University of Athens makes every effort to provide its staff and students with, including our Erasmus Plus and CVs or Kivis programs 
the uh, new uh, European University Initiative, and so much more via our international bilateral agreements of scientific cooperation. In its millennia long history, Hellenic culture has always kept alive a sacred, the flame of hospitality. Respecting a catering for the unknown other, be it traveler, refugee, or even the outcast, has been a way of uh, peaceful interaction between converging or diverging traditions and ideas. The same applies for Canada and the Canadian people constantly ranking at the top of international community in terms of uh, multiculturality, human and civil rights, and democracy. Confronted today with a variety of challenges on Earth, and not only, there is urgent need to reimagine our understandings of affinity and alterity, a goodwill of goodwill and of xenophobia, and to progressively articulate new goals so all citizens may access the required knowledge and skills to lead their lives as creative individuals and competent professionals in a rapidly changing world and a rapidly changing society. This is why I extend my heartfelt congratulations to all the esteemed faculty members from the National and Capodice University of Athens and the same Simon Fraser University for organizing today's event. Special thanks to, Kirky, to Professor Kirki Kefalea for her efforts. Uh, he, she is always eager to uh, undertake such initiatives of such kind. Uh, congratulations uh, uh, also to all our promising researchers from both Greece and Canada for opting in for exploring this outstanding, in my view, theme. I sincerely wish you every success in the proceedings of uh, Xenos workshop. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you very much, dear Vice Rector, for your support. And now I would like to invite Dr. Irini Kotsovili from Simon Fraser University to provide her welcome notes as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Kepalea. Dear Vice Rector for Academics and Student Affairs, esteemed colleagues, dear students, dear all. It is a privilege to be here with you at the School of Theology of the National and Cambodian University of Athens, which was established in 1837. I'm very grateful to our hosts and fellow members of the organizing committee of this workshop, the colleagues from the Department of Social Theology and the Study of Religion, namely Dr. Kefalea, Dr. Vespoldi, and Dr. Lukaiwis and a member of the graduate student community, Dr. Kennedy Dimitrios Alexopoulos, for their excellent collaboration while preparing this workshop as well for their gracious hospitality. As Dr. Kefalea mentioned, the workshop's topic allows for broader reflections and dialogue between disciplines and established and up-and-coming academics. It is also bringing together our academic communities here at the National and Capodistrian University of Athens, with representatives and students joining from the Department of Global Humanities and the Stavros Nyarko Center of Hellenic Studies, the Benaby Campus of Simon Fraser University, located in British Columbia, Canada, on the unceded traditional Coast Salish land, including the Slewatu, Coquitlam, Squamish, and Musqueam nations. So this is a very exciting occasion that brings us all here today. As mentioned in our program, we will have six sessions. 
taking us from the ancient to contemporary approaches in relation to the topic, each one followed by a short plenary. We will begin with reflections on others in pre modern material culture, from textual references to epic and proto Daoist texts to costumes and design by Mithiadis Vasilopoulos, Belina Stefania Stenberg from the University of Athens. And our colleague from SFU, Associate Professor of the Paul Code. Mr. Mithiadis Vasilopoulos, please proceed. Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. Thank you. My dears, good morning. Kalimera Ksemi. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be here and share some of my thoughts with you. What I'm about to tell you concerns the foreigner as it is depicted in certain passages in the Homeric epics. For the ancient Greeks, hospitality was an idea, a very high value. That is why they had appointed the mighty Zeus, father of gods and men, as her protector and had given him, among other things, the nickname Senius Zeus. Moving, of course, on the same reasoning, Homer has filled his epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, with incidents of hospitality and highlights in every way the high value of this idea. And don't know, not only but that, but it also presents us with almost all aspects of this institution, from the, the reception to the departure of a foreigner. But today, rereading the Homeric epics and in a different way, both social and theological, and having before us the social parts of our time that have to do with the foreigner, every foreigner in every social fabric, we are in position to distinguish a different perspective what Homer wrote about some incidents of hospitality to foreigners and to make a reduction somewhat different to do in today's time. One could say that it is an irony that a blind so-called poet wrote an excellent literary work we refer to the Iliad in which he cites in a wonderful way the perspective on the entire the entire ancient world of the time. And in fact, today, if one reflects on the intervention of the gods in the world of people in the, way, in the Homeric era and reduces it to corresponding social and psychological forces and pressures in our era, one will not find great differences between the worldview of that time and today. In a corresponding way, the protagonist of the Odyssey, Odysseus, is a universal foreigner of all times and all societies who appears every time as different as the situations require. At the beginning of the Iliad, the priest of the god Apollo, protector of Troy, Croesus, visits the camp of the Greeks with many gifts and mainly with the promise to beg the god to grant victory to the foreigners, to the enemy Greeks, with the only consideration being that they give him back his beloved daughter who has been taken as a booty by the leader of the Greeks, Agamemnon, based on the ancient Greek hospitality, but also his position as king of all Greeks, Agamemnon should have received the priest honorably, respected his status and age, respected Zeus and the other gods, appreciate the offer for the good of, the, of his people and to give back the girl, thus gaining the victory of 10 year war, but also the reputation that he, that he is the one who gave the solution to such an unfavorable situation for the people. But instead of all this, Agamemnon preferred personal satisfaction, treated the priest rudely, and told the father that he would abuse his daughter as long as he lived. It is, we think, more than obvious, the modern reduction of this incident. In modern societies, we can easily distinguish similar behaviors, showing power, authority, 
selfish, selfishness toward people of all groups of people who are in moments of weakness, need, and supplication. Human selfishness, whether at the individual, collective, or governmental le level, repels the dictates of moral values, repel, repels respect, repels the value system advocated by religion, and pushes man to actions against man. The stranger priests who came to plead for help and mercy remained forever the strangers who came to distort the pleasure in our lives. Moving far into the Iliad and reaching the climax of the war, the moment arrives when the two opposing heroes, Hector and Achilles, will face off against each other. But before this duel, the prince of Troy, Hector, enters the palace and anxiously searches for his, for his wife, Andromache, and his baby child. He does not find them in their house, but up in the castle, where Andromache, full of fear, had gone to see the outcome of the battle. In a surprisingly touching moment, Andromache confesses to her husband that he represents everything to her, that he is her father, her mother, her brother, her husband. He is her whole world, and she doesn't want to lose him. Accordingly, Hector makes his own confession and tells her that above the meaning of his father is, is his meaning for her and for their child. And at this point, it expresses something very current and modern. That is, that if security is lost for these two, if he himself is lost and they become refugees in a foreign land, all they will receive is pain, insult, and harsh hardship in an uncertain future that will last a lifetime. How present is the future that Hector sets for his wife and child? How current situations reflect his word about people forced by riots, wars, and conflicts to reach other places in search of what constitutionally everywhere are rights for every human being? How violent the future becomes when violence comes to deprive the self-evident in life. How a life turns into torture from the moment a person is transformed from a fellow human being and familiar to a hated stranger. And how purposeful is it is that Hector plays his last hope in the world. At the beginning of his second epic, The Odyssey, Homer tells us of Odysseus stay in, with the fairy Calypso, whose name means she who hides something. Calypso wanted to keep Odysseus close to her forever, for her own personal satisfaction, but also to selfishly confront to other goddesses, doing something they never managed, namely to keep a mortal who fell in love with her forever, manages to imprison Odysseus on her isolated island for about six years and enjoy him exclusively so that she can even continue to have him as hers, she promises his immortality and power. Odysseus arrives at the island of the stranger fairy, an outsider who is being exploited, a stranger who under the guise of love is imprisoned and obliged to provide his services. Does this have another name today? Do we recognize different but corresponding contemporary situations? In modern times, the similar phenomenon that preoccupies society and is problematic with its extent, but also its intensity, is a daily occurrence, exploitation of foreigners of both sexes, and in fact, most of the time, in a violent way, for the purpose of pleasing those who can, because they simply have the ability while foreigners do not. And if Omer gives us the solution by having the mighty Zeus intervene and put an end to this situation, in today's society, despite the various, the various legislation, we have not yet managed to establish 
such a strong will and action to stop this phenomenon. And since we are on the, since we are on the grounds of the theological school, we couldn't help but make a theological observation of the matter. So, reading Homer alongside Mark's gospel, we found many similar references to the foreigner and the way he was treated in these two texts. And Odysseus in Homer is a stranger who suffers a lot algea, meaning he suffered many calamities. Accordingly, Jesus, although in, of the same origin, is a stranger in his society who suffered much, pola pathin, that is, he suffered a lot. Odysseus in Homer returned to a house in which he was treated as a stranger, but uh, by enemies who wanted to kill him. Jesus returned home to Jerusalem and was treated as a stranger by enemies, his own people, who wanted to kill him and finally did. The incarnate word was a stranger to the scribes and Pharisees, the stranger who threatened the most important thing they possessed, authority. They saw him as an enemy. They feared him, and therefore they had to destroy him. They saw their authority, their beautiful ordered lives, threatened by an outsider who came to overthrow the establishment, the establishment and take away their precious authority and power. And in the face of every foreigner, today's societies face the same fear. The fear of disrupting their lives we lead, of overturning the tranquility we think we have institutionalized in our lives, accurately forgetting the synonym of the word foreigner, which is the word fellow man. Thank you very much, Theodorakopoulos, uh, to thank him. The name is Andrew from the National Catholic University of Athens. We proceed with our second speaker, Evelina Stefania Dempet from the University of Athens. No, it's Professor Paul Crow. Oh, oh, oh. Dr. Paul Crow from uh, SFU. <laughs> and uh, let's take some minutes to check this the presentation. Okay. Sorry. Uh, would you like to transfer it to my USB directly? Mm -hmm. Be sure because um, can you yeah, there, there is no. I don't have a USB. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So okay. okay. I can just. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes, thank you. I don't care. Project it. But uh, you have sent it to, to Dimitrios who explained us now. Yeah. So, okay. okay. Proceed and I will I will make you a promise. Okay. okay. Calimera, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you to all of the organizers for making it possible to uh, share so much uh, diverse scholarship uh, among friends uh, in the academy. Today, I'm, I'm going to be addressing the theme of estrangement rather than the stranger. Um, and I'm going to be addressing it from the, from the perspective of a warring state thinker named Zhuangzi. And Zhuangzi was reacting at, in a time of chaos to, to an antidote to that chaos preferred by Confucius. He did not agree with Confucius' approach. And so what I'm gonna be talking about is the nature of that disagreement and how it's represented in the text of the Zhuangzi. I should start by saying the text itself is about 100,000 Chinese characters in length. And I have selected approximately 400 characters out of that to translate for the purpose of discussing this theme. So suffice it to say, there's plenty of room for additional insight that I will not be able to share in the course of 10 minutes. <laughs> And let's push on. Uh, we may or may not be able to see my presentation on the screen, but it, it's, of, uh, it's of no matter since it's really just five quotations. So 
for those of you who do not know the name Zhuangzi, I'm going to just give you a sense of where he fits relative to other famous people from the Warring States period in China. The Warring States period extends from roughly 475 to 221 BCE. The first name obviously is Kongzi, Confucius, who traditionally is said to have lived from 551 to 479 BCE. Mozi, who is said to have lived from roughly 470 to 391 BCE. Shunzi, 313 to 3, sorry, to 238 BCE. And finally, Han Feizi, 281 to 233. All four of these had different recommendations for how to deal with the turmoil of interstate rivalry during this period. Um, I'm going to be dealing only with Kongzi and Zhuangzi, but suffice it to say, there were diverse ideas about politics and about how to solve the problems of violence. Okay, press on. What I'm gonna be talking about is estrangement from the body itself. Zhuangzi wishes to separate or distance us from our own embodiment. Why does he wanna do that? He wants to do that because Confucius believed that the ritualized disciplined body was the way to train the individual to realize moral values in their social conduct. The Chinese in this period, if I can, call them Chinese, <laughs> it's a bit of a disconnect historically, but uh, they had four words that they would use to describe the body. The first is gong, and gong refers to the disciplined body uh, that is seen after ritual training takes place for a lifetime, from childhood through to adulthood. The way you stand, the way you hold your arms, the way your sleeves hang down, the way you arrange your cushions before you seat yourself on the floor. These are all examples from the Analects of Confucius. And they all reflect the notion that your cultivation and refinement are displayed through your body, through your bones, your sinews, your muscles, your clothing, your gestures. That's gong, that kind of body. Shen is probably closest to what today we would call the person. So those are things, lessons you learned from your parents, lessons you might have learned at church or at the synagogue or, or what have you. They, these are ideas that you absorb through reading, music, friends, and so on. And they shape the projection that you make out into the world through your body. But this is a much less formal than the disciplined body uh, uh, that, that occurs through, through ritual. And then there's xing, another kind of body, which is really just your shape, your physical shape. Um, it's not amenable to cultivation or anything like that. It's just the general human shape of the body, the, the limb, two limbs, two legs, so the, and, and so the two arms, two le legs, and uh, head, and so on, just the gen general shape. And finally, ti, ti is the body of flesh. Um, and in this context, it's really uh, a very ecologically understood form of the body. It's a body which is continuous with the space around it. For example, many of you have heard the word qi. Qi is this, um, I don't know how to describe it. <laughs> uh, normally people say energy, but that's a very modern uh, term from physics. Um, but qi flows through the universe in a very sort of liquid way. Uh, it uh, used hydraulic metaphors to describe it. Flows through the body. It enlivens the body, it constitutes the stars in the heavens, the plants in the soil, everything. And the human body is seen as, as part of that flow. So it doesn't actually have any clear delimitation in space. It's part of the world around you. Uh, so you are continuous with that world. Um, okay. Oh dear, <laughs> I will press on. Um, I'm going to read a quotation now uh, that I took from the Book of Rites. This is a book that describes ritual conduct in this period, um, and it's, it's something that reflects Confucius' own view of how the rites work. The book, so valued by Confucius, says, parrots are able to speak, 
yet are indistinguishable from other flying birds. Apes are able to speak, yet they are indistinguishable from other beasts. Now, a person who lacks ritual conduct, is their heart not also that of a beast? As such, therefore, merely being beasts, lacking their rights, fathers and sons could mate with the same female. On account of this, the sages undertook creation of the rights in order to instruct people and cause them through the rights to realize what it was that separated them from the beasts. So the rights discipline you, they establish you as a human being for Confucius did not believe that we were born human. This was something we had to achieve. It separated you from the world of animals and plants and so on. Strong to disagree. And now a quotation from the Zhuang Zi. Lady in waiting Mao and concubine Li represent what people take to be beautiful. The beautiful women. Yet if fish saw them, they would swim down into the depths of the waters. If birds saw them, they would fly up to such heights. If deer saw them, they would immediately run. So of these four, which knows the correct beauty everywhere under the sky? From my perspective, the beginnings of humanity and righteousness and the paths of right and wrong are disordered and confused. How could I possibly distinguish them, he says, rather controversial observation relative to Confucius. So Zhuangzi is saying here, no, our ideas that we have values separate from the rest of the natural world are fabulations. We construct them. Next quotation. Therefore, on account of this, consider a stalk. He's thinking the stalk, the word in Chinese is a stalk uh, of a small plant. Consider this, a stalk and a pillar that supports a building, or a leper and the beauty, Qi Shi, another famous woman. Whether vast, changeable, scheming, or grotesque, the Tao, the way, comprehends all of them as one. So our values, values that we impute to the human form of beauty, of being handsome, of graceful, of being graceful, of being whole, are all um, being undermined by Zhuangzi. He wants us to get away from this standardized sense of what constitutes a perfect or well-cultivated human form. The third of the five quotations. He's now going to talk about someone whose body is, is warped. Um, his name is Shu, Mr. Shu. As for fragmented and broken Mr. Shu, his chin conceals his navel. You have to picture this. His chin hides his navel. His shoulders are higher than his head. The vertebrae at the nape of his neck point directly at the sky. His five viscera are on the top. His two thighs press into his armpits. With a pointed needle, though, he can work as a tailor, and he has enough to get by. Shaking a winnow to sift the grain, he has sufficient to feed 10 people. His form, xing, is fragmented, yet it is enough to nourish himself. He's using the, using the word shen here. And to complete his number of years. In other words, to retain his health, his vigor. Moreover. If his virtue was fragmented in this way, wouldn't that be wonderful? Yes, controversial point. And the last quotation, 55 seconds over. Zhuangzi said, now, okay, Zhuangzi was married. His wife passed away. His friend Huizi, I guess we might call him a logician, came walking by and saw him pounding away on a tub and singing. And Huizi thought this was the height of impropriety. And so he challenged Zhuangzi on this. I, I don't understand why. Zhuangzi said, it is not so. Thus, when she first died, how could I alone fail to grieve? But then I thought about her beginning when she originally lacked life. And the Chinese word there also can mean birth. But I thought not merely of when she lacked life, but when she originally lacked even her form. 
not merely when she lacked form, but when she originally lacked her chi. So the chi hadn't even coalesced into anything approximating his wife yet. In the midst of vastness of the universe and change, there was chi. The chi changed and there was form, xing. The form changed and there was life. So now again, there is change and she is dead. This resembles the motions of the four seasons of, and he lists them out of order, spring, autumn, winter, and summer. So my wife is for now resting in the bedroom of a vast palace, yet I was wailing and crying. But then I realized it was because I didn't understand the nature of life. And so I stopped. Thank you very much, Dr. Pro. We move now to our first paper by Evelina Kohania Denta from the University of Alpha. And I remind us all that. Yes. Okay. Remind us all that we're taking uh, questions. Uh, we might have to merge our Q and A's. If you could please write down your questions so that we can address them all all together. We may skip Q and A. Uh, we might do two sessions together. So, uh, Evelyn. Minute, yes. To prepare our presentation here. In the meantime, it's always a perfect time to write your name on the Zoom chat so as to be able to have a certificate of attendance. One minute, please. Dear colleagues, guests, friends, it is great to welcome you today I hope you are enjoying your trip to Athens so far, and I'm really excited to talk to you about the foreigner in Palestine through the lens of garments. One of the locations that hold a prominent role during the first century, both historically and geographically, is undoubtedly the area of Palestine and more specifically Jerusalem. Acting as a crossroad between the ancient trade routes, connecting the regions of the so-called Fertile Crescent, Egypt, Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, Mesopotamia. It was a multicultural composition that often, among other things, brought to the surface the clothing choices of the citizens and the influence of the political, religious, and social groups to which they later belonged. The influence from the Romans and the Greeks, but also the additional influence of the eastern currents of Mesopotamia Persia and Abyssinia, now Ethiopia, was evident, turning clothing to elements of recognition and identification of the foreigner, while at the same time being a factor to his rights and his obligations. Clothing was not something that left citizens indifferent, and was certainly a part of everyday life that didn't go unnoticed. The faction of clothing has two sides. On the one hand, the clothing that someone wears affects the environment in which they are, constituting a form of communication and a highlight of its person's personality. On the other hand, it affects, defines, and saves the person who wears it. Clothing, therefore, automatically highlights the dynamic form of a culture, as well as the historical and socioeconomic dimension of the people who created it. The evolution of the clothing has always been closely, dependent on the form of work and performs, the religious choice and the social status of the individual, while climatic conditions play an equal important role. If we make a leap to earlier times, we can draw the following conclusion that the clothes of the Mediterranean people due to the warmer climate were simple, comfortable, and almost without seams, hymation, tunic, tongas. My presentation will focus on demonstrating the clothing elements that were considered religious, as well as working as political traits. The purpose is identification and highlighting of the foreigner in the predominantly Jewish Jerusalem of the first century that characterized 
and stigmatize any foreigner through his choices. In the short time I have at my disposal, I will focus on two groups of foreigners, A, the Romans, and B, the Jews with obvious Hellenistic and Eastern influences. In Judea, the social class didn't have as much divergence as, for example, in Rome, where the division depended on money. The high mission and the tunic form the basic element of a non-stranger's attire. Their use can be traced back to ancient times, while on days of repentance or mourning, men and women wore the back ties around their waist, which was made of very thick cloth. However, the greatest demand was for woolen tunics worn mainly by lovers and peasants when they wore. In the Gospel of John, there is a relevant reference to the moment when the soldiers following the crucifixion of Christ and during the separation of the clothes cast lots for a tunic so as not to tear it. And then apply a factor that determined one's clothing was the profession they, they practiced. For example, a priest's daily clothes were simple and consisted of the short breeches, a white high mason fastened with a belt, and a social cap, while the high priest had exactly the same outfit, but more richly. The rabbis were distinguished by their strict dress and by the seal they wore on their foreheads and hands. Having referred to the garment of the non-stranger, I will describe the garment of the stranger. The foreigner appears in many forms in Jerusalem, being found in unexpected places, with clothing being a quiet way of highlighting the foreigner. First stranger, the Romans. As mentioned above, Jerusalem at that time was under the regime of the Romans. This meant that the city was besieged by Roman soldiers whose presence if nothing else, was immediately felt. Alongside to the legionaries, they were auxiliary troops whose main occupation was the guarding of buildings and general policy. They were usually armed with a sword or bow and arrow and didn't wear any kind of helmet or armor. The officers differed in that they wore a centurion's helmet and sometimes a scaly breastplate of the Asiatic type. The Roman governor, who resided in Caesarea and visited Jerusalem only during the great festivals, was dressed in magnificent attire as was his entrance into the city. He always wore the so-called tonga, which was the most important element in the ancient Rome wardrobe, a one-piece woolen garment that was pulled loosely around the shoulders and under the body and could be wrapped in different ways. While in times of triumph the Roman emperor, he chose the Tonga Perperia, a robe of purple dyed wool. Magistrates and high priests wore a special kind of Tonga with a reddish purple band at the lower end called Tonga Pretexta as a sign of their status. Second stranger, Hellenistic populations. Likewise, Hellenistic populations were of similar scope. Many Israelites spoke the Hellenistic language while it was common to give Greek names or to Hellenize Hebrew. Let's not forget that many cities were given Greek names, for example, Decapolis. The fact that Jesus himself spoke the Greek language stems from a reference by the evangelist John when Jesus, following the triumphal entry, meets the Greeks after the latest demand and the mediation of Philip and Andrew bearing Greek names. In the virus daily events, in the shape of the buildings, but mainly in the clothing, the influence was great because beyond commercial transactions that citizens, but mainly the Israelites of the diaspora, socialized with philosophers and orators, as, uh, orators, excuse me, as well as the Israelite philosopher Philo from Alexandria. The clothing of the Greeks consisted mainly of the tunic, the veil, the high mason, and the chlamys. The tunic was a garment worn by men and women, with the only difference being that the men's tunics hung down to the knees, while the women's tunics fell to the ankles. 
The veil was worn only by women and was usually woolen with its buttons on the shoulders. The tap was folded to the waist to form a flap for the purpose of double fabric covering of the upper body. Third stranger, diaspora and the East. Throughout the year, and especially during the major holidays, for example, yeah. Easter, Pentecost, etc., a huge percentage of pilgrims visited Jerusalem. There, one could meet the brothers of the entire diaspora and recognize them by their attire. Some examples include the Jews from Babylon who were dressed in a long black cassock that trailed on the ground, the Jews from Phoenicia with colorful tunics and kerchiefs, the Jews from the Eastern Plateaus with capes made of goat hair, and the Jews of Persia who shone in their gold and silver embroidered silks. Travelers wore woolen robes and often garlands, something that had been started by the Romans and slowly spread. On top, they wore a special overcoat made of goat or camel hair, which very thick and waterproof to protect them from the weather and adverse conditions. The best ones were made in Anatolia and Cilicia, while it is observed that a similar coat was worn by the Apostle Paul on his travels, and in fact, during his captivity in Rome, he begged his disciple Timotheus to bring him the coat he had left in Troas in Carpus. When you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus, and the books, especially the parchment, 2 Timothy 4.13. In conclusion, the polychrome and polymorphism of Jerusalem made it a city in which one met the stranger whose clothing reflected his origin, his social position, his work, his status. Thus, clothing is, as it is today, a means of highlighting the power, history, and personality of a person. Thank you for your time. Thank you for our first uh, three presenters. I would like to remind everybody to please uh, make note of your questions. We will address them after the conclusion of the second uh, the second session, which we are initially beginning now. Uh, starting with Professor Vespotis, if he can take a little microphone. Thank you. Uh, good morning to everyone. Kalimera uh, Solus. Thank you for this uh, opportunity. Uh, the subject of this uh, presentation is the contribution of the Gospel of Matthew in dealing not just with a stranger but with a barbarian. It should be noted that this Gospel is the most popular in the Christian community and played a crucial role in the formation of the identity of Christianity. To achieve our goal, we will focus on characteristic passages of the Gospel the treatment of the foreigner Xenos as opposed to the barbarian in the Roman Empire and how New Rome ultimately addressed the foreigner barbarian dichotomy in texts of worship popular to this day. Matthew as the gospel of the immigrants. We have unique references to the stranger at the beginning, middle, and end of the Matthew's biography of Lord Jesus projected as uh, Emmanuel and the suffering servant of Isaiah. A. Ruth appears in the 42 forebears of Jesus, specifically in the first 14, portrayed as a stranger par excellence in the relevant book and Judaism as a whole. The tree itself ascends to Abraham, the convert's father, and archetype of the traveling Jew. B. As a newborn, Jesus is, projected as, is presented as a refugee in Egypt, the most important country of asylum in the Bible. C, a foreigner who struggles with Christ for the cure of her daughter also dominates the heart of the gospel, the Canaanite lady from what is now Lebanon. D, the Messiah is uniquely connected with the stranger uh, as with the prisoner in the ultimate story of the gospel, which applies to all nations. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. 
I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. E, using a unique form of dramatic irony, the blood of Emmanuel, which as only Matthew emphasizes, is pulled for the remission of sins becomes a means of burial for the strangers. The chief priests took the pieces of silver and said, it is not lawful to put them into the temple treasury since it is the, the price of blood, your blood. And they confirmed together and with their money bought the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. It becomes apparent that Matthew in the gospel of the stranger and even the refugee addressed the most likely directed towards Jews who were compelled to undergo trauma since they become refugees in Antioch, a cosmopolitan city under dreadful conditions, following the fall of the holy city to the Romans in 70 AD. In their new home, they were also excluded from the synagogue, which served as a multi-purpose center for diaspora Jews because they believed in a crucified Messiah. But how did the Pax Romana feel about immigrants and barbarians? The stranger, foreigner, and the barbarian in the Pax Romana. We are aware that Christianity was born and perfected when for the first time in the history of humanity, there was peace, at least on a political level, and early globalization conditions. The listener's first impression is that following Alexander's openness to foreigners, there is no longer a distinction between strangers and barbarians in the Mediterranean, but all humans flow equally across the internet of our roadways and our sea. However, as the following reasons demonstrate, this is not the case. A, as the tragedies about the sapiens demonstrate, this uh, privilege of philoxenia was mainly reserved for people who could prove common descent or some kind of kinship. B, the greatest example of Hellenistic Greek sculpture, the colossal art of Jews at Pergamon, glorifies the triumph of the barbarian. He is typically originating from the exotic East, having unusual features and an incomprehensible non-Greek voice. The gift of foreigners, of, the, of, of foreigner and uh, foreigners and hospitality is distinct from the devaluation of the barbarian element in both ancient Hellenistic novel and in Philo. D. Undoubtedly, the fact that Jews found themselves strangers in Egypt is a necessary component of their identity. Of, uh, of their identity. However, this does not imply openness to every barbarian person or nation. Compare the Hellenistic and Jewish prayer formula in which the Greek man thanks fate for not making him an animal, a woman, or a barbarian, or where the Jewish man thanks God for not creating him a Gentile, a woman, or an ignorant man. The Christian movement established a new treatment of the stranger by identifying the Messiah not only as a foreigner and an immigrant, but also as a refugee and a prisoner and by projecting him as a brutal, killed, crucified Messiah. Already in Matthew, the Christian community in multicultural India is portrayed as a new nation, one that, unlike the other Pax Romana nations, is not rooted in antiquity and mythical ancestors, but shapes its identity through, firstly, a crucified one, secondly, the proclamation, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, and thirdly, the future participation in Christ's kingdom. Early Christians were self-conscious about being parochial and transitory. The paradoxon in the worship of the Eastern Church. Although the first Christian communities saw the face of the crucified in every other person, regardless of whether he was a foreigner or a barbarian, in the worship of the Eastern Church, the following paradox is propagated. In the sixth century, on the occasion of the wars against the Persians, the very popular hymn, Save, O Lord People, victorious over the kingdom against the barbarians, is established. On the other hand, on Holy Friday, when the epitaph enters the church, the very beautiful troparion, Give Me the Stranger, is sung to this day. After all, as the poet Kavafi says, perhaps human, human nature after the fall needs barbarians to form an identity. 
Give me the stranger. Having seen the sun hiding its rays and the curtain of the table torn apart after the death of the Savior, Joseph of Arimathea came to Pilatus and he is begging him with these words. Give me the stranger who has been a stranger since he was a baby. Give me the stranger whom his compatriots hit him, killed him as if he was a stranger. Give me the stranger whose strange death surprises me. Give me the stranger who knew how to welcome poor people and strangers. Give me the stranger who dues out of envy and strains from this world. Give me the stranger so that I hide him in a tomb since as a, as a stranger he had no place where he could lay his head on to. Give me the stranger whom his mother, having seen him dead, was mourning, saying, O my son and my God, even if my entrails are consumed by pain, even if my heart is shaking, see you dead, I glorify you, hoping for your resurrection. <clears throat> and with these words, having convinced Pilatus, the revered man, he takes the body of the Savior, which he wraps with thaw in a sheet and smears with perfume before laying it in the tomb. He who has offered everyone eternal life and his great blessings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We proceed with uh, in the in the statement the PhD candidate at the University of Kentucky College of University of Kentucky. Hello, Shifate. Welcome here today. I will speak to you about uh, nonverbal communication as a way of approaching the stranger. Communication is a basic and fundamental element of human existence, acting as a survival mechanism between people. It comes from the need to connect and interact with each other within and outside of our social cultural group. The behavior of each of us becomes a message to each other are called upon to respond. A percentage of our communication with others is verbal, while the rest is nonverbal. More or less obvious elements of communication as nonverbal messages are the nod, the smile, the look, the grimaces, the handshake, the gestures, the gait, as well as the distance from the one we are communicating with. The use of gestures as a way of communication does not require the abandonment of verbal language. Some body movements and gestures have become universal, transcending cultural and geographical boundaries. That is why the elements of non-verbal communication work as a basic way of approaching a stranger, the person lacking in verbal communication and who often speaks a different native language. Today, they function as a kind of substitute or supplement to the verbal message. But in the ancient world, gestures served as a means of conveying information that was often different from that conveyed orally and constituted a distinct form of communication. The handshake and the, and the similar arm-to-arm -arm gesture were symbolic acts in the Greco-Roman world with varying meanings depending on the occasion. As gestures of recognition or greeting, they were a vital function of initiating contact between strangers. Today, the handshake is a mild, formal greeting. In contrast, in the ancient world, it was considered a more formal gesture, signified a mutual perception that the other person is worthy of recognition and further relationship. Thus, the handshake functioned as a set of actions consisting of offer, acceptance, and mutual perception, and was often part of the ritual of hosting the stranger. Philoxenia in Greek language, hospitality, etymologically means the offering of love towards the stranger regardless of his status. In ancient times, it was a basic cultural and religious institution protected by Xenia Zeus and included a special ritual. Since Homeric times, there was a warm welcome with an undress and handshake greeting to the stranger, a formal invitation to host him, a bath and anointing with oil, clean clothes, fine food and drink, even a feast and games in his honor. After that, 
Basic verbal identification communication was carried out with the guest to know his name, where he comes from and what he wants. The host promised to help him and finally bid him farewell with gifts that sealed their friendship for generations to come. Another great institution with a certain ritual was the supplication as a fervent request for protection or help that was protected by a guest users. The supplicant would kneel before the one who is begged, usually a man, with one hand clasping his knees or his right hand, while with the other he might touch his chin or beard, those parts of the body considered the seat of man's life and physical strength. In fact, the supplicant could resort to the altar in a temple or to the hearth inside the house. In serious matters, the supplication should never be interrupted. In this way, the stranger was received as a holy person, enjoying immunity as a guest. Supplication had a religious and legal character, possessing ritual formality and embodied principles of secular justice. The Romans attached great importance to the visible distinctions of status, mm -hmm. wishing to recognize the social status of any stranger they met, whether free or slave, patrician or plebeian, and to behave accordingly. In addition to material signs of rank and position, such as a horse's gold ring, not verbal cues, i.e. gestures, how one sat, stood or walked, even one's speed and style, conveyed important information about his social status. This was included by the French sociologist Pierre Boudier, defining the concept of the Roman habitus. Overall, the ancient Mediterranean world associated the exercise of control over one's body and life with one's social status. People of very low social status, such as women and slaves, depended on the demands and desires of others of higher social status. In the Old Testament, from the beginning, God placed under his protection every weak creature of society, such as orphans, widows, the poor, slaves, and strangers. Welcoming and caring for the stranger was a sacred duty, including the offering of bread and clothing, along with respect for his personality and work. According to rabbinic tradition, the greeting of peace to all, familiar and strangers, is the path that leads to peace. Literally, the Hebrew phrase, Salom Aleichem, peace be upon you, is the greeting used when meeting a stranger, but not necessarily accompanied by physical contact. It depended on the relationship between the persons and couldn't express sympathy, love or reverence, interest and honor, and included any of the following, verbally inquiring about health and non-verbally blessing, bowing, kneeling, pilgrimage. When meeting a great person, the ritual of blessing was followed as Melchizedek blessed Abraham and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Joseph's brothers bowed to him with honor, offering him gifts, and Abraham and Lot hosted the Lord. Hospitality included food and accommodation, if needed. On the other hand, someone should not greet a person at night if the speaker cannot be identified, or if someone is busy with his work, he does not need to greet or respond to greetings. In the Old Testament, the supplicant wore sackcloth and put ashes on his head, in supplication to God. The people and the king of Nineveh listened to the prophet Jonah, a stranger to them, and fasting from food and water, they put on sackcloth and sat in the asses, begging God. To this day, on the holy day of Sukkot, the Jews imitate the stranger, with a certain ritual remembering their wanderings in the desert after their liberation from Egypt. They all eat together, go around holding branches of palm, willow, myrtle, and citron, and sing Hosanna in the sukkah, a makeshift hut made of branches on the roof or in the yard of the house. The Jewish prayer Tahanu comes from a story of public humiliation in the time of the first century AD in the Talmudic Baba Messia. The word Tahanu means supplication. The most unusual aspect of this prayer is its posture. With one arm outstretched and the head resting on it as an intense gesture of pleading for God's mercy. In the context of the Greco Roman world, Jesus Christ lived as a stranger, touring the land of Israel for three years, 
and reached out to people using verbal and nonverbal communication in a special way. After his resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples, showing them his hands and his feet. This is not only seen as evidence for, of his resurrection, but also a focus on two important parts of the human body for his mission. With his hands and his feet, he fulfilled the Old Testament law for the protection of all the weak members of society, molding clay with his hands and touching the eyes of the blind man from birth, a socially collapsed man. He gave him light and welcomed him to a new life. At his feet, he accepted the anointing and the washing with tears of the sinful woman who was unacceptable in the Jewish environment. Jairus fell at his feet as a supplicant, and Christ held the hand of his daughter, greeting her and bringing her back to life. Jesus acted as a home for the bleeding woman who touched his garment, providing her with asylum as a cure. The Canaanite woman begged Christ, showing patience and faith in the face of his silence. Jesus did not despise her as for Amen, but he highlighted her, opening the door to the nations according to John Chrysostom. In conclusion, Jesus Christ welcomed everyone without discrimination, helping them whenever they needed him. He did not completely follow the rules of behavior of his environment, but approached the people around him by hosting them. In this way, he shows us how to approach the stranger according to his example. Thank you for listening. My thanks to our presenters for their papers. We will now move to the Q&A session, which due to time constraints, we will only take two questions uh, for now, and then a short break afterwards. May I ask my colleagues if they have any questions? Professor Vernis, Professor Adonopoulos, Professor Lensbordis, Professor Fanaras. I have a question. Yes, your Yes. Question to Dr. Paul Crow. Uh, Dr. Crow. Professor Crow, if you would like to come uh, here, show us a bit of Yes. For our online audience. Thank you. Sure. I'm just a member of the laboratory and teaching staff in this department. And my subject is Eastern religions, mainly Hinduism. So, uh, well, I was impressed about your uh, presentation and that Chinese concepts of ideas, they are very interesting and they resemble Indian ideas. I could say that she sounds like Indian prana or a uh, I want to ask you, what's the impact of this concept in daily life or in society in general? I, the, the, yeah, the, the impact of, of, the, of the notion of qi yeah, yeah. in daily life and society in general, uh, yeah. that, that, that's uh, obviously a very uh, difficult question to answer concisely. Um, uh, on one level, uh, the idea of qi and uh, cont entails continuity of the what we think of as the body with the world around it. And I, I mentioned that in terms of the Chinese word qi, um, the, the flesh, blood, breath, and so on. And that, uh, that idea of qi in relation to this bodily form um, served as the foundation for the development of medical theory in China, um, starting in the later Han Dynasty. So um, yeah, uh, roughly first century uh, CE, uh, they began to theorize about uh, bodily health uh, using the qi. So it had a long-term impact on uh, medicine and continues, of course, today uh, with modern practitioners um, in, in hospitals. Uh, so. I'm, I'm, acupuncture, um, herbal remedies, application of heat to parts of the body and so on, um, forms of movement or exercise. I, um, I practiced the 
the movement of a Tai Chi Quan for almost 30 years myself. And uh, so this, this idea that movement of the body um, uh, creates flow and good health and a clear mind. Uh, I point to my head when I say mind, but probably in the context of warring state China, I should point to my heart. <laughs> Um, so it's, that's one example of an impact. There, there are many others, but I, I think time is time. Time is uh, short. Right. Right. We have another question. Any other questions? Yes, please. I have a question. Ready? Ready. Uh, I have a question for Professor Kroll, uh, myself. Um, uh, thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. I was wondering, uh, does this notion of uh, uh, reality as uh, this unitary notion of reality as being one imply um, like an absence of the notion of otherness in an ontological sense in, in the Chinese mindset? The, the first cautionary note I would I would make is that there there is no Chinese mindset. So that there are, um, as I was saying at the beginning, there were, I mentioned four thinkers and they they had really quite divergent views. So I would say that's that's the first thing. As to whether or not it precludes so ontological uh, level of differentiation. Yes, like the distinctiveness of, yes. of, of identities of things and things. Right. Um, not on a day to day level. Um, so Zhuangzi, for example, was very critical of how we use language. He thought that we that words, the meaning of words, is very slippery, and context sensitive. So we have to be cautious about words. And yet, we have expressions of ideas associated with someone we call Zhuangzi in a hundred thousand characters. So he wasn't. He was quite happy with language. And in the same way, identity and differentiation were something he would have recognized. But he cautions us that beneath those identities, which we largely construct in social context, there is a more fundamental level of unification, of unity. And he, so the idea of separateness that we've been talking about, of strangeness and being estranged and being a stranger, he's trying to provide, an, I suppose on some level, a remedy to this, no, this idea that we, we see others differently and we distance ourselves. Now this makes no sense to him. And so he presents us with very distorted, Unusual bodies, for example, uh, I gave you one example. Um, so yes, there's distinction, but no, in the final analysis, he sees the world as 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 one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. We are fine. Here's one others. Only comment before I came here. I was wondering if any of the presenters will say something about the great Senus Jesus Christ. I would like to congratulate Professor Respotis and Marina for Akira for this. Uh, for mentioning what Joseph said in the last. Thank you. Because this guy is a great example. Thank you. Thank you everybody. We will now take a brief five minute break before returning. Okay. And uh, one announcement before the break, because it is it has merit, it has merit. The the coffee break, one announcement, please, before the break, one announcement. The coffee break. Coffee break is a kind uh, is a kind contribution of the postgraduate and PhD candidate student union of this department of social theology and the study of religion. We have the president of the union here, Anastasios Balkos, a PhD candidate, if you would like for some seconds. Um, this, uh, this student union does not retreat for in, in making uh, important things for the university. And I thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, dear teachers, uh, dear students, uh, after two sessions and in the beginning, after two exemplary and informative introductions, I'll be brief. Uh, on behalf of the postgraduate students and PhD candidates, I extend a warm welcome to all our colleagues from Canada and the Simon Fraser University. 
and uh, I wish to you every success in today's workshop and a pleasant stay in Athens. Thank you. Thank you so much. Coffee break time. Five minutes coffee break. Five solar solar minutes solar minutes. Not, uh, <laughs> 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 Uh, so we are uh, we are on our coffee break, we, and we are watching the international workshop on Xenos, Genos in English, the stranger, the foreigner, the refugee, organized by the Stavros Nyalsmos Foundation Center for Hellenic Studies of the Department of Global Humanities of the Simon Fraser University, and uh, the Department uh, for the Study of uh, Social Theology and the Study of Religion of the National and Capodistria University of Athens, Greece, staying that in a very short while we will be with you. In the meantime, let's see our program here.
Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ το αγαπητό μα ελληνικό και το διεθνέ κοινό. Όπω είπαμε, είναι μια εκδήλωση που διεξάγεται αποκλειστικά στην αγγλική γλώσσα. Τα μηνύματα στα ελληνικά θα είναι σπάνια και σύντομα. Αλλά δεν μπορούμε να μην σα ευχαριστήσουμε. Α, αυτό το κοινό, αυτό, η εκδήλωση, αυτό το γεγονό ήταν γνωστό. Είχε ανακοινωθεί ότι ε, είναι ένα διαζώσει γεγονό. Έμφαση, ε, έμφαση έχει δοθεί στη διαζώσει παρουσία όλων των συμμετεχόντων. Και πραγματικά είναι αξιοθαύμαστο πως σε μια τόσο ειδική μέρα για τα ελληνικά δεδομένα η εξυγχρονισμένη αίθουσα οπτικοακουστική διδασκαλία τη Θεολογική Σχολή, μια αίθουσα που εξυγχρονίστηκε προνοία των αρχών τη Κοσμητεία, κοσμήτωρα του κ. Καταγιάννη και των υπολείπων μελών τη Κοσμητεία τη Θεολογική Σχολή, είναι πραγματικά αξιοθαύμαστο ότι είναι κατάμεστη, πραγματικά κατάμεστη σε σημείο που να νομίζουμε όλοι ότι, ζούμε, ότι βρισκόμαστε σε μια καθημερινή μέρα κάποιου υποχρεωτικού μαθήματος. Πραγματικά, πολύ πάνω. Και εδώ στο όριο, βρίσκεται στο όριο της αντοχή τη και ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ που με τη διαζώση παρουσία και με τις αποστάσεις φυσικά δίνουμε ένα θερμό καλωσόρισμα σε ένα διεθνές πανεπιστήμιο το Simon Fraser University, όπως το δικό μας φυσικά είναι διεθνές, το Πανεπιστήμιο Αθηνών, για την προώθηση διεθνών αμοιβαίων συνεργασιών. Μπορείτε να γράψετε λοιπόν το όνομα και το επώνυμό σα στο chat. Όσοι δεν το έχουν σημειώσει, αργότερα θα είναι δύσκολο να κάνουμε παρόμοιε ανακοινώσει τέτοιε, διότι είπαμε ότι πρέπει όλη η διεξαγωγή να διεξάγεται φυσικά στην αγγλική γλώσσα. Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ. Σε πολύ λίγο και πάλι μαζί.
They are all in a few minutes. We will be able, we will be able to begin with the uh, next session. Let us see on screen. As, uh, as you may have noticed, as you may have noticed, the title, the title of each uh, session of each panel is inspired by various places of uh, the island uh, Lesbos, of Mytilene. And mit like Mytilene session, Madamado session, Agiaso session, all these are very beautiful places on the island uh, of Lesbos. So, so it's a very interesting program. Yeah. Madamado session, session C, that is, will begin shortly.
20th century music and literature. The papers presented in this uh, section are by MA and PhD candidates, David Lennox from Sheffield and Agilpi Kore from University of Okay. Pending Lennox, I think. Is he joining us online? Yes. Pending Lennox, uh, you may open your screen, your microphone, or else uh, we may proceed. We may proceed. We may proceed. Yes. Ah, okay. Perfect. You know, may need to. Not there. Okay. It's a uh, guilty core, yes, so. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. In the meantime, in the meantime, uh, everyone that wants to acquire an, a certificate of attendance may write his or her name on the, on the Zoom uh, chat. In a first, the friends are going to see what I've been to put the time for you. I'm finished. I can also come in and be a point. All right. I'm sure 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 Good morning again, dear colleagues. We are going uh, to take a look on the poem of uh, the Greek poet Angelos Ikenayonos alongside with the short uh, novel of Mark Twain. The Greek poet Angelos Ikenayonos was born in 1884 on the island of Mercada. His poem titled The Stranger is an adaptation of a Homeric motif, namely the arrival of Odysseus at the island of Scheria or Scheria also known as Phaesia or Fekia. In this poem, Sekanos borrows a theme from Homer, which he represents in the form of the dialogue, the traditional Tichomythia. The stranger here, he said, is Odysseus, who just arrived at the land of Phaesia, while the woman he's talking with is no other than Nasica. You, uh, you can read the poem, the translation is mine, um, the land of Asia is ruled by, Hill, by, by King Alcinous. At the gate uh, of his palace, there are statues of two hounds made by God Hephaestus himself. Behind this gate, there is a stunning garden with evergreen trees. Now, as we know, that the mythical region represents Utopia. It is a peaceful, self contained community, the people of which have a deep connection with nature and the gods. The peak of his social structure is the king, the monarch. The paternal figure that, that preserves that balance and at the same time unchanged connection between his people, the mortals, and the gods, the immortals. It may seem to us that Phrygia is somewhat an ideal kind of kingdom, immune to the basic problems of the developed society, to every kind of struggle and conflict, be it social, political, financial, or ontological. The truth is, it's the complete opposite. In 1995, the now retired professor of English studies at Dowling College, Andrew Carp, published a very interesting article titled The Need for Boundaries, Homer's Critique of the Fakian Utopia in the Odyssey, where he stated, that Homer actually painted the beautiful picture of Asian society to criticize it. We sum it up as follows. Carl assumes that the Asian society is in fact too perfect to be true. 
The people are ruled by Mike Petiak, whose role is to keep them in a controllable bubble, the core of which is the relationship with their gut. The relationship between the Fasian people and the gut is unhealthy. The people think that uh, they are close to them as gut favorites, but in fact, they are nothing more than a group of formalists that neither understand nor interact with the gut. As a result, the imperial society cannot evolve. It is static, it is irreversible. Let us recall a verse by the great English poet William Blake. Expect poison from the starting potter. That is, everything that doesn't make some kind of progress, even because it is perfect as it is, is doomed to fall. Now, Odysseus arrives at Phrygia as a stranger, but he's not only a stranger to the people, not only an unfamiliar, an unfamiliar foreigner, he's a stranger to their whole worldview. And that's why the first thing he does when he makes his appearance is to pay no mind to their fundamental laws. He doesn't care if the evergreen gardens are forbidden. He doesn't care if God Hephaestus himself created their guardian. He doesn't care about the king and his order. Odysseus knows that has to do with an unreal utopia. And he's curious enough to explore it, but also wishes to remain a stranger to it. That's how, why he tells Nasica that he will reveal his name and his story only after he's inside the garden. The Homeric hero we know as Utis, namely nobody, won't reveal his genuine uh, name as long as he remains in his distorted society that he is constantly falling prey to the impenetrable, the, um, sorry, to the metaphysics of uh, its perfection. It is a reasonable assumption that in the sphere of criticism, the stranger is like a virtuous devil, someone who doesn't uh, want to harm people, of course, but only to unveil an ontological deadlock, stemming from the completely ignoring the protection of a god. Sikeyanos Odysseus reminds us of another virtuous devil with similar purposes. In Mark Twain's unfinished novel, The Mysterious Stranger, Three boys live happily in a God-fearing uh, Austrian villa. One day, a little stranger appears in the villa, a handsome boy who reveals that he's an angel called Satan. Although he's not our familiar Satan, the fallen angel, the lord of hell, but his nephew with the same na name, and he doesn't intend to do any harm to the people. After a series of disturbing events, young Satan makes the boys witness incidents of all kinds of religious fanaticism that appear throughout the world, like bloody conflicts, execution, and mass hysteria. In other words, Satan helps the boys understand that unquestioning religious theories and practices which grow out of the belief that we are something like God's um, representatives on earth can only lead to a distortion of our reality, usually seriously dangerous to human life itself. Needless to remind Satan's shocking final words to the boys, I quote, There is no God, no universe, no human race, no earthly life, no heaven, no hell. It is all a dream, a grotesque and foolish dream. Nothing exists but you. And you are but a thought, a vagrant thought, a useless thought, a homeless thought, wandering forlorn among the empty eternity. Here again, we have a polemic against the people exclusive blind dependence on the God they probably know nothing about, regardless of what they may think they know. The boys in Twain's novel live in a peaceful, close society, like here. Although the village is not some kind of utopia, in like manner, people definitely express a passive attitude towards everything. They think they have a perfectly balanced relationship with God that inevitably makes them hypocritical and narrow-minded. Until the stranger makes his appearance, just as this can also avoid to a stranger is a symbol of rational objectivity, a symbol of question. The close societies of Ikea and the Austrian villa are characterized by a form of intellectual and moral detachment. The arrival of the stranger signals the detachment from the detachment. 
the very act of one processing, questioning, and choosing between various currents of thought that, that can lead to an outer view of the world we live in. That's why seeking a notion of this just and to a Satan maintain their fundamental anonymity at first. Both of them must remain strangers to the people of the close society they visit, in order to show them that there is a distance between them and the rest of the world, to prove that the introversion has led them to a distorted reality. In a way, every type of stranger that enters a community or a society uh, incarnates willingly or not the possibility of a parallel truth, while it's always hard to even think about such a possibility, let alone accept it. The crucial question is what remains after the stranger that departed? Will the society become better or worse than before? Will the very idea uh, of parallel truth liberate it or incite it to entrench itself in an even stricter closeness? The answer, the answer depends partly on the dynamics of the society and partly on the motives of the stranger. But it's safe to say that nothing is possible for the society without the, the stranger. The small rock that disturbs the sunken water of our common. Thank you very much. I'm not sure if uh, the uh, second speaker has the opportunity, uh, if they're experiencing technical difficulty. If they are not able to join, we will see. Yes, we may proceed. We if, to the section. if the speaker yes. in the meantime becomes available, he may at will, at will uh, opt in. Absolutely. And we take questions together as we did yes. earlier, joining the two sessions. So uh, then we begin our fourth uh, session of our workshop that explores the legacies of the Asian minor catastrophe. In this session, we will hear from Dr. James Montasso and Dr. Apostolos Michaelis. <laughs> yes, freely, freely, freely. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as I told you, this classroom, this venue rocks. Yeah. <laughs> I'll say no more. And thank you to my cheering section. I appreciate it. So, first of all, thank you to the University of Athens for having us here today and hosting such an excellent event for our venue. It's just been fantastic so far. This is part of a larger paper that I wrote looking at deferring EU responses with regards to migration. So if you have any additional questions at the end, please feel free to talk to me during the break or just during the question period. In 2015, Greece was a country in crisis as it found itself unable to manage the mass influx of refugees. Oh, oh, did I turn on? It's open, it's open. Okay, okay. 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 Yeah. I'll start again. In 2015, Greece was a country in crisis as it found itself unable to manage the mass influx of refugees and migrants into the country. European leaders, citing the Dublin regulations, commonly framed it as, quote, a Greek problem despite the migrants seeking to exit the country for other European countries. In the 2020 migration crisis that was cut off by COVID-19, unlike in 2015, however, when Greece found itself isolated due to the Greek financial crisis, the European Union actively assisted the country. The European Commission, uncertain of Greece's ability to police the borders of the EU, had transformed from Greece being the outsider to Europe's shield. The deferring responses by the European Union directly reflect the changing priorities of the organization and its efforts to maintain its prominent position as part of the core in global affairs. In 2015, Greece was perceived to be the uh, problem child of the European Union, with its role in the EU financial crisis causing European leaders to consider expelling it from the organization. By 2020, however, Brexit, as well as Turkey changing from a potential member candidate to a rival actor, caused the EU to reevaluate Greece's role in the continent. The country, to apply Emmanuel Wallerstein's world systems analysis, had changed in the eyes of the European Union leadership from a European peripheral space to a global semi peripheral space due to its change in the political setting because of the international migration. So in 2015, Greece had overtaken Italy as the primary country of entry by migrants and refugees into the European Union. As instability in Syria increased due to the Syrian civil war, and Italy became increasingly proficient at preventing migrants and refugees from entering Europe via the central Mediterranean route, 
Greece's location and political troubles made it an ideal entry point. Furthermore, due to the financial crisis, the Greek government lacked the means of protecting its borders, especially given the unprecedented scale in comparison to past migrations. Furthermore, as a result of the referendum gamble, uh, Greece, within Greece, the country in Europe, at least well equipped to deal with a major crisis, initially dealt with the migration issue largely on its own. Even when the European Union sought to intervene, they actually end up aggravating the problems. Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, declared in August 2015 that her country would ignore the Dublin regulations and not set a cap on the number of refugees it accepted into Germany. While this dealt with the humanitarian concerns and alleviated the pressure upon Greece, Italy, and other countries uh, on the frontier of Europe, it actually ex exacerbated the refugee crisis facing the continent. By giving migrants the opportunity to reach Germany via Europe's uh, preferring Greece, more migrants and refugees undertook the journey. These migrants and refugees were not only from Syria, other groups, notably Afghan and Iraqi nationals, attempted to use Germany's newfound openness to enter Europe in greater numbers as well. So Greece initially faced 2015's migration crisis alone. However, things would start to change starting in 2016. Specifically, the most significant development for the EU and its existence occurred this year, the United Kingdom's European membership referendum. Against the backdrop of the 2015 refugee crisis, the UK sought to renegotiate its relationship with the EU. This was not a new development. The UK, since joining the European Union in 1973, had consistently chafed at regulations and policies that it perceived as infringing upon its national sovereignty. Tensions subsequently escalated. Although the full scope of Britain's tumultuous relationship with the EU is beyond the scope of this paper, migration concerns were of paramount importance for those within the UK who sought to leave the European Union. Great Britain uh, leaving the European Union, furthermore, would cause the Euro European Union to reevaluate its stance towards Greece. The UK's decision to leave the European Union changed the calculations of the decision makers in Brussels towards Greece. Previously, politicians in Brussels were concerned that Greece and other countries that faced major financial strain in the aftermath of the financial crisis, Spain, Portugal, and Ireland, would destabilize the Eurozone and threaten their position as a core within the world system. Brexit, however, represented an even greater threat to the organization than Greece and the other countries. The Eurozone, although an important part of the European dream of integrating the continent, was simply part of a broader strategy. Although Greece challenged the, the form that European integration would take through its financial policies, the people themselves never gave up on the dream of EU integration. Even at the height of the financial crisis, a full third of the country still held a favorable position of the EU. While individuals may argue that only a third of people holding a favorable opinion of the EU indicates that the people gave up on the organization, given the domestic issues Greece faced due to the austerity measures imposed by the EU, this still actually remains a fairly significant number. Furthermore, by 2019, once the worst elements of the austerity measures had passed, the favorability rating had returned to 53%. Conversely, the people of the United Kingdom, by voting to leave the European Union, represented a fundamental challenge to the organization's right to exist. The EU issues with Greece, therefore, were no longer as significant as they've been in the past. Therefore, unlike in 2015, the EU would take a hardline stance against migrants and refugees in 2020. Furthermore, the governments of Germany and France, the two core countries of the EU that opposed the more strenuous measures proposed in 2015, have faced significant challenges uh, domestically since 2015. These developments made opposition to the more strenuous border defenses proposed by Austria, Hungary, and other European states difficult, if not impossible. Thus, immediately before the global pandemic halted Turkey's attempt to weaponize the refugees against Europe, the EU stood relatively united on its issue due to its need for Greece to provide a buffer between it and the rest of the world. So in conclusion, the EU's need to solidify its position as one of the key cores of the international system led to different responses to the refugee crises in 2015 and 2020. In 2015, the EU, seeking to stabilize the monetary aspect of the supranational organization, initially left Greece to deal with the measures citing the Dublin regulation. Even when Germany and other key states of the EU intervened, they did so only to preserve their own positions within the organization. In 2020, however, the position of the EU was less stable than it had been in 2015. Therefore, European countries supported Greece to a greater degree in 2020 than it had been willing to do in 2015. 
Thank you.
1,200 people, all Greeks. The Baltic school paying for teachers to teach the Greek language and history to their children, and a church dedicated to the Assumption of Virgin Mary. Time in general did not always flow calmly. The reason is that an ethnic cleansing started against the Armenians in 1894, later on, on against the Assyrians, and finally against the Greeks. Though I am not a historian, I think that the most detailed book to find out what happened then is written by two Israeli scholars, H. Benny Morris and Rolf Zeviz, The 30-Year Genocide, Turkey's Destruction of Its Christian Minorities, 1894-1924, published by Harvard University Press in 2019. It recounts that on that period, three waves of violence swept through Anatolia, targeting the areas inhabited by Christian minorities, which until then counted for 20% of the population. By 1924, they were reduced to 2%. In the village of my ancestors, no mass slaughter occurred as far as I know. However, displacements from 1914 to 1918 took place. Soldiers were coming to village, rounded up village, the villages, separated them in teams and led them to remote barren places. There, without food and clean water, deaths were by cholera were common. On the 15th of May, 1919, the Greek army landed in Smyrna, the present day Smyr. With its arrival, the plan of the great idea, in brackets, was implemented, which was the liberation of the Christian populations in the partial land detachments of the faltering Ottoman Empire. In June 1920, a part of the army arrived in Yelichflik and the inhabitants welcomed it with a great enthusiasm. Both my grandfathers enlisted as volunteers in the army, most not notably in the Second Army Corps under the command of Prince Andrew, the great grandfather of the present king of the United Kingdom. Charles III. In the, the Second Army Corps reads as far as Sakaria River, where a battle took place lasting for 21 days between 23rd of August to 13th of September 1921, during the counterattack of Young Turks Army led by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. The Second Army Corps titrated, as did the entire army. My parental grandfather was captured and taken to a prisoner's war camp in Adana, and he was released in 1924 after a prisoner exchange. In the meantime, his family were forced to leave the village, bought in a cart to the harbor of Mudanya on the north coast. My other grandfather was lucky. He met his family at that point. They tried to hug him, but he stopped them, saying that he was covered in lies. Finally, the villagers managed to reach Greece at the port of Piraeus, thanks to the kind offer of Philippus Cavunidis, a rich ship owner, who made his ships available to transport them. After that, they moved northwest raised to Lemaida, a town in northwestern Greece, and half of them settled there. The other half migrated northeast, looking for a place where water, stones, and wood, as they used to say, would be available and plenty. Eventually, they found a village at the foothills of Mount Pagiel that had all three. Greeks and Turks alike were living there in separate districts. The Turkish people were scared because of the war, but also due to the hostility and mistreatment by the native Greeks. 
the relations of the refugees with the natives were not good at first. The locals derogatorily called them Turkospori, that means Turkish offspring. Then, according to a decision taken by the state, the refugees had to be hosted by Turkish families who had to take care of the food and accommodation expenses of them. My maternal grandfather's family was hosted by a Turkish family named Karahasan. When Ahmed Karahasan went to the village closet to pay what my grandfather owned, he found there was no debt. Ahmed asked my grandfather, well, don't you eat? And my grandfather replied, since you are hosting me, must you also feed me? Ahmed Karahasan never forgot that answer. He didn't have a child at that time. My grandfather had the son. The Karahasan couple treated this child as if it was a young. In fact, they wanted to adopt him. The Karahasan couple, oh, sorry, the two families became so close that my grandfather's nickname was now Karahasan. On the 30th of January, 1924, the Convention on Exchange of Greek and Turkish Populations was signed in Lausanne, which called for the exchange based on religion. So the Karahasan couple, Ahmed Unaise, left Greece, but communication between the two families never stopped. Exactly 100 years had passed since then. The last time I met the descendants of Ahmed Karahasan was almost a year ago, and I hope to meet them again. I said this story to remind that despite the differences between people, whether ethnic, religious, or whatever, what remains that is that we are all humans, they have it in the same world. I believe this thought is best expressed by Stephen Hawking, the famous theoretical physicist and cosmologist. In his last book, titled Brief Answers to the Big Questions, he writes, when we see the earth from space, we see ourselves as a whole. We see the unity and not the divisions. It is such a simple image with a compelling message. One planet, one human race. Thank you for your time. Thank you to all our presenters. We now have time for questions. Open to the floor. Would you like us? We'll please hit yes. Yes, like yeah. We can up. We can take questions. Then we'll proceed. To don't mind yes. with our penultimate session yes. Yes. on identity. Mm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we now turn to the penultimate session of identities as brought in contemporary literature with papers by our colleagues Alessandra Capertoni from uh, as and Eleni Kiviaco from the University of Lisbon. Hello, everybody. Can you all hear me? Yes. Excellent. So my presentation uh, uh, focuses on a short story by the French-Algerian writer uh, Albert Camus. The title of the story is uh, translated into English as uh, The Guest, a translation which uh, carries uh, the sign of the impossibility of translation, of the double bind, the aporia of language, as I will discuss later. I'm reading the story in the context of a Camus' repeated return in his work, to the theme of exiles in centers, which is best represented in this novel, L'Etranger. But for the sake of time, my reference to the novel will be marginal. 
I chose the story for discussion because of the intriguing approach to the theme of exile and foreignness, an approach that is remarkably resonant with the Jacques Derrida trope of the ghostliness of language, and in this case of the ghostliness of the stranger that upsets the mastery of home and ipsity, but also for the questions that it raises at the time, our time, when notions of home, belonging, identities have renewed their ferocious double power. Uh, Lot, uh, which is uh, the French title, translated as the guest in English, was uh, published in a collection entitled L'Exil et les Royaumes, Exile and Kingdom, by Gallimard in 1957. The title of the collection ties the theme of exile to the six shorter stories that it contains. The story recounts an episode in the life of a French Algerian schoolmaster, Daru, who lives and teaches on the Algerian plateau. His pupils come from impoverished and Arab-speaking families. He loves his work and the place where he lives, which is also where he was born. One day, a police officer of his knowledge, Balducci, with whom he is in friendly relationships, arrives unexpectedly to his place and leaves an Arab prisoner in his hands. The Arab renames, remains unnamed throughout the story, as in the case of the novel The Stranger, where the victim or the, the protagonist's murder remains throughout the Arab. We know that Camus was extremely precise in crafting his stories, and this choice obviously deserves some attention. The task given to Daru is to take the prisoner, who is guilty of murdering his cousin over a question of grain, to the next police station. The gendarme Balducci cannot complete the delivery since he is wanted back as soon as possible. There is in fact a talk of revolt and possible attacks on the part of the Arab population. In the background of the story is the ongoing Algerian revolution to which both speakers allude, but the impending danger is that the people of the prisoner will try to free him. Throughout this time, the Arab barely speaks and does so only in response to questions posed to him. Daru at first refuses this task, but has no choice. It is a police order. Left alone with the prisoner, he cares for his physical well-being until the next day when they leave. Coming to a crossroad, Daru consigns to the prisoner food and money and shows him instead two possible destinations. One road will lead him to the police station where they're waiting for him. The other will lead him through the plateau where they can reach the nomads who will host him as from their customs. Then he departs, leaving the speechless Arab behind. But after some time, he comes back to the point where he had left him, only to realize that the Arab has taken the road to the police station. He then returns home, and on the blackboard of his classroom, he reads a message left for him in chalk. You handed over our brother. You will pay for this. The story concludes with the narrator's remarks about the utter loneliness of Daru in, his, in this land that he loved so much. The story presents many interesting points of reflection, especially in relation to ethics, but I will keep my discussion brief for the sake of time. In French, the word hot contains a double meaning. It is both guest and host. This double connotation gets lost in modern English, which replaces the two words for one. The words host and guest share the Proto-Indo-European etymological root ghosti, meaning stranger, guest, and host, all three at the same time. These are terms that imply relationality, but also bear connotations that have evolved in time as opposition. A guest can be a friendly visitor, but also a stranger, an enemy, or a parasite. A host is someone who offers hospitality, but the term can also indicate a gathering of war. The French term has maintained the characteristic of what Derrida would call undecidability, where one word can produce different meanings that conventionally are mutually exclusive. The ambiguity of the French hot is central to the story. Who is the guest? And who is the host in the story? 
on one level, the guest is the Arab, and to some extent, perhaps also the police officer, Balducci, who arrives unexpectedly. Yet the Arab is indigenous to the land, unlike Daru, who belongs to the settler community. The choice of the title reverses the problematic relation of guest-host relationship. We're invited to reflect on the conditions of settler colonialism, where the true invited guests are in fact the French, or in a broader sense, the colonizers, and the unwilling hosts are the native Algerians. But the philosophical thrust of the story does not seem to be content with this explanation. Settler colonial relations play an important role in the story, but at the same time, the tone established by the third person narrator does not assign them the ultimate interpretative key. While the cultural difference between the characters is kept in full sight, it is the ethical relation between them that invites the reader's attention. The schoolmaster, we are told, feels like an exile everywhere except on this land. More particularly, he experiences his home like a kingdom. It is a mastery of ownership and of self-presence that brings together the dimension of the political and of self-consciousness of being oneself. Such mastery is unsettled by the very law of hostility that he exercises toward the Arab. Simply accepting him as a charge in his house, he cares for his well-being, providing him with the food and the place to sleep, while being concerned about his unnecessary physical restriction. In short, he provides xenia. The Arab becomes less of a prisoner and more of another human being, but this hospitality shakes the mastery of Daru. His political and ethical beliefs regarding the current colonial war as well as the crime of murder, are both shaken. Something has entered his house, and that something, under the guise of the Arab, is the nature of hospitality as unconditional hospitality. He attempts to escape the demand that is now coming from hospitality, hence the final attempt to free the Arab by giving him the possibility to flee. But it is a failed attempt, not only does the Arab make an unexpected choice, choosing the road of his imprisonment, but the Rusa return is met with an anonymous writing on the blackboard, taking him to task for his choice. Who is the author of this writing? The logical suggestion is the people from the Arab's village whose law has not been respected. And yet there is no certainty of this uh, in, in, in terms of reading, interpretation. The writing appears as inscription of the consequences of the perversion of the law of hospitality, or hospitality as mastery over the other. But its origin is unknown. Perhaps it is an inscription of the land itself, a silent but not voiceless character in the story where ethnicities, nationalities, languages, customs, and different understandings of the law are all put at play, and where the violence of the law of the proper can only be voiced as violence against the land, something for which all human groups are responsible. Thank you. Now we can speak with no second before for the session, and anything that will be invested this week. Dear colleagues, dear students, thank you so much for having me. Um, can go closer to the microphone? Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> dear colleagues, dear students, thank you for having me. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I will be speaking, I will be speaking about my paper, exploring the intricate relationship between gender, history, memory, relation, and trauma in 20th century European and Canadian Holocaust literature. Specifically, it delves into my ongoing translation project focused on Nikos Kastit's notable work, works, 
Erga, originally published in 1976 and championed by Sakatinopoulos, the poet, a close, and a close friend of Kahlisi. The completed translation encompasses the main novella of the collection, The Ugly Beauty, or Omar Fashni, in 1960, authored by the Greek Canadian writer himself, who is often regarded as Greek's response to literary figures such as Pessoa or Kafka. Moreover, this study aims to analyze how Kastichi skillfully inter intertwines uh, his own biographical subjects with his literary persona, thereby questioning the reliability and malleability of memory. Um, so, in short, um, I will be discussing the um, biography, the end of the translation, the translation in progress, the main novella, Bertrand Stern or Amorphasmi, Kastis' memory and unreliability, gender and amorphasmi, and encompassing uh, and describing the rest two of the novella in a dream, an Ipnion and which friends, P. Philly, uh, encompassed under the Erga um, umbrella. Um, so Nikos Kastitis was born in Gastuni in 1926. Uh, and he died in Patras um, in 19, 19, excuse me, 1970. He was a second son in a family of six, son of Thomas and Mogomeni. His father worked for the railway, and Nikos grew up moving from city to city. In September 1940, he enrolled in the high school in Patra, where he met Dinos Liopoulos, and it would be defining for the rest of his life. He started writing and initiated the publishing of his first journal with his classmates titled Melissa. They were forced to stop, though, uh, publishing after a while, after a while, he disrespect. He moved to Douala in Cameroon, but returned and finally, upon the invitation of Alex Atulari, he leaves for Montreal, Canada in 1956. They marry and they have a son, Thomas. He publishes while he keeps while tutoring both English, French, and Greek to the children of the Greek diaspora. At the same time, he works at an important company handling rare scientific books and also appointed as an interpreter for the Canadian court. He considers every work that he does menial and just to pay the bills while they keep him from his true work, writing, as he mentions to a letter to his dear friend, George Daniel, University of Toronto. Uh, moving on, uh, discussing the methodology that I'm, I used in my translation and the connection that um, we can see with um, three of two of his friends, uh, Sakis Sinopoulos and George Daniel, and also Dino Studiopoulos later. My first layer will be the textual translation. The first layer of the textual will be the examining the difficulties of the local choices of words. He has some intricate uh, interest in fabricating his own words. Uh, also, I will be focusing on, or I have focused, in fact, uh, on grammar and syntax. Um, Verbs will be looked at in order to find the correct association to tenses, find important part patterns or possible exceptions, such as I have an entire story to tell you, I decide to not keep the verb right that you because it is uses and substitute with tell, giving more the narrativity than and losing the writing effect. As an intertextual intertextual work, apart from the fact that it's coming from a Greek immigrant. The focus of the novel lies mostly on the post-Holocaust trauma subject. Forms of address, pronouns, and expressions give some indication as to the relationship between the characters. Um, and in terms of diction, which is the second layer of translation, I look in depth at the function of the language register and the presence of some Anglicism in the original work that I tend to keep. The plot he, where I have to focus is in the subject, is in the subject. Uh, it is quite important to understand the story and constant agony of the protagonist to convince her torturers, her audience, that she is only Jewish by origin, but Catholic since birth. Uh, leading to the third layer of the analysis, I have to address the issues that occur re regarding the fictional and not so fictional characters. The internal dialogue that seems that the writer is going through as Gertrude reveals Informal, important information. The text is not just another novella, it's a long letter from Gertrude to the writer. Moving on to Omar Fasimi. Omar Fasimi is uh, Gertrude Stern, a mysterious Jewish uh, Austrian woman in the aftermath of World War II. The inspiration of Gertrude Stern's character was a woman he maintained a relationship with in Montreal. At least that's what he claims in a letter to Yoris Parklopoulos, another dear friend of his, for a short while. 
meaning three days. According to her narration, she wasn't sent to any camp, but was actually kept imprisoned in the Viennese, in the Viennese Polish uh, police department for a year before releasing her. She was haunted by her persecutor, or at least the person that she kept finding ahead of her in her outings with her friends and post her mother's death, who considers him the main responsible and instigator for her arrest and trauma. Even though Gertrude isn't religious wise a Jew, but a Catholic by birth, uh, Cassius managed to prove that was claimed years later in the European analysis of the Holocaust, that the genocide wasn't solely religious oriented, but also ethnically. After all, they focused only on the most vulnerable members of society, like the Romani, the mentally and physically impaired. Um, when it comes to uh, Castiz's uh, memory and unreliability, George, for George Daniel, um, Castiz's imagination was able to form a character and a relationship out of nowhere. He would see a simple glimpse of a person was more than enough for him to construct a story. Stern represents the reflection of the Holocaust in the post-war trauma that Castiz carried throughout his whole life. He was deeply persecuted and deeply troubled. Gertrude, or Gerda, as she prefers to be referred to, Constant dwelling with the past is at a point as obsessive as Cassidy's. That burden and guilt that he carries as an immigrant is found in all of his novels, considering himself at the same time both a good and a bad writer, belittling himself in his confessions through letters to Daniel and to Loveless as well. Um, I quote, don't be sarcastic towards me, Tychus, and tell me that I became a great writer because you're fairly aware of the doubts that surround me and will keep surrounding me until the day I die. The prism under I saw my translation was under the feminist theory of translation, keeping and uh, manipulating the, the text, having Gertrude as the main writer and not Cartesis. He was the only uh, person that, in fact, he was a writer that, in fact, um, lived Holocaust by proxy. Um, it is uh, that of observation and this particular sensibility that urged him to research and write on the and probably identifying that the person he met stranded away from his homeland, facing the same trauma, abandonment, and fear of loneliness that he did as well. So he decided to lend his male authored voice to Gertrude in a non patronizing way. Um, when it comes to the dream, uh, and Ipnion, and uh, which friends he feel, in the dream, it's the concept of inception in literature, the dream within the dream that is explored. He narrates the story of a dream Sinopoulos had about an old girlfriend of his that he prefers not to be named. Sinopoulos wrote about this in their correspondence and asked him to change the girl's name out of fear she might recognize herself. And in the novella Which Friends, are the three friends meet at Pavlopoulos' house for the first time. Uh, the narration includes a continuous reinvention of the three protagonists' friendship and ongoing literary discussion, especially in the novella, which friends remind us the discussions in the old literary salon concerning the narration, the traditional beginning, the main high and low point at an end, is catalyzed and Cassidy centers his narration around a jeu de mots and a sarcastic dialogue with his friends. Uh, in all, when it comes to the word, the, the work, works, Erga, the inclusion of both novels under the works happened due to Stakisinopoulos' zest to see his friend's work published. In their correspondence, it is described by both the ongoing Castiz's adventure of publishing anything either in, English, in Greece or in Canada. In Greece, because it was hard to pay, it was hard either to pay or convince the publishing work. However, Christianopoulos helped him greatly. And in Canada, because it was hard to find all the printing elements he needed for his printer, and he ended up carving them himself or buying some from Greece and having them sent in Canada. Um, summarizing, um, three of the most important of Castis's work are fall under the general title Erga, which friends the narration of the first meeting and Omar Fahimi, the story of the life by proxy of the Jewish Austrian woman. And a nickname, of course, which is the um, um, the dream within the dream. Um, Castitis was always longing for the ultimate, the, uh, the utopia that would never be reached. He left Greece thinking and hoping for the best to be found in Canada, yet unfulfilled was left there and healed. How can he not when every immigrant's wish is to be back and see their loved ones? Just like Castitis confessed in his deathbed to his brother in Patras that he regretted his passion that he exhibited from his youth for the unfulfilled and, and, and traveling. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Many thanks to our presenters for all we had to present. Uh, our first uh, final session focuses on the 21st century perspectives and new directions on understanding self and other. Our presenters for our session are Alexandra Katerina Akopoulos Liao, the, the clinical structure of history and psychiatry at Well Cunel Medical College. And Mr. Demetrios Alexopoulos is a PhD candidate in our department. Okay, we may proceed with the first. Presentation of the session. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good morning. Telimera Kalispera. I'm delighted to be here today. And um, I'm sorry that I can't join live or in person because of the time difference between New York City and Athens. But thanks very much to the organizers of this workshop and especially Professor Kirki Kepalea for this lovely invitation to what I'm sure will be a fascinating, rich, and important and indeed very timely workshop on a concept that I feel especially close to, uh, the concept of Xenos, uh, both personally and professionally. Personally, because of my background, having been born in Greece to a Greek uh, father and a Quebecois mother, and having lived in four different countries, I'm familiar with the concept of being neither here nor there. I'm familiar with uh, being in two places at once, being a Xeni, in, in different environments, culturally um, and linguistic, and, and indeed with the untranslatable, um, again, culturally and linguistically. So from a personal level, but also, and perhaps more importantly for, for today, uh, I'm interested in this as a historian of psychiatry and psychoanalysis, as someone who works on the various ways in which the other has been represented and continues to be represented in psychiatric language, but also in various other cultural forms, forms of, of discourse. Um, so we can think all the way back to the beginning of the 19th century, around 1800, with the foundation of what is now called psychiatry, which at the time was called alienism. Um, for the father of modern psychiatry, Philippe Pinel, this Frenchman, put forth this idea that the aliéné, right, what we, we might call otherwise the madman, was he who had lost a part of himself, um, a part of reason within himself. And the goal of this new therapeutics, the goal of this new discipli discipline of, of, of um, alienism, alienism, was to help this person regain that part of himself that, he had lost. And then, of course, with Freud, with the advent of psychoanalysis, uh, for what else is psychoanalysis and the unconscious, really, than an other xenos inside of us and an obsession with that which is unknown and unknowable, ultimately. So what I'll present today, and I'll share my screen, is part of a new project that I'm working on, which has to do with um, a specific kind of other and a specific kind of self, which is uh, part of a broader project on trauma, which I'll tell you a few words afterwards towards the end. But we'll focus today on a novel by Algerian writer and journalist Camille Daoud, and the title of the novel is called Meursault contre Enquête. So this is a novel that came out about 10 years ago. It was quickly translated into English as the Meursault Investigation, and it garnered a number of awards, most notably the Goncourt First Book Award. And those of you who will have read um, Albert Camus' 1942 novel, The Stranger, which happens to be uh, translated into Greek as Oxenos, will notice, will recognize in this title of Camille Daoud's book, the word, the name Meursault, which is the name of Camus's protagonist, Meursault. Now, those of you who have read uh, Camus' book will also remember that 
the one of the main scenes in that book, The Stranger, is the killing under the glaring midday Algiers sun by Meursault, by the protagonist, the killing of this nameless Arab. And so what Kamel Daoud does in this retelling, this reimagining of the story is retell the story from the perspective from, of the other and here from the perspective of the Arab, of that nameless Arab, or more particularly from the perspective of the brother of the nameless Arab, because that man, of course, has died. So it's worth um, sharing with you the opening lines of the book. Mama's still alive today. She doesn't say anything now, but there are many tales she could tell. Unlike me, I've rehashed this story in my head so often, I almost can't remember it anymore. I mean, it goes back more than half a century. It happened and everyone talked about it. People still do, but they mention only one dead man. They feel no compunction about doing that, even though there were two of them, two dead men. Yes, two. Why does the other one get left out? Well, the original guy was such a good storyteller, he managed to make people forget his crime. Whereas the other one was a poor illiterate god created apparently for the sole purpose of taking a bullet and returning to dust, an anonymous person who didn't even have the time to be given a name. Oops, my... Okay. I'll tell you this up front, he continues. The other dead man, the murder victim, was my brother. There's nothing left of him. There's only me left to speak in his place. As a matter of fact, he notes a couple of lines under that. That's the reason why I've learned to speak this language, by which he means French, and to write it too, so I can speak in the place of a dead man, so I can finish his sentences for him. So to give something, someone, a name, is to give them a space in the world to make them real. Here, Arun, the narrator, the brother of the nameless Arab who was killed, restores his brother his name and therefore his humanity. My brother's name was Musa, he tells us from the start. By telling his story, the narrator offers a personal counter archive to the archives of the state, archives which, as we know, are missing, erased, have been effaced from the story and from history. It's a spiritual journey, a quest which follows an unusual trajectory. The book offers us a kind of a disfigured, disjointed narrative with um, the logic of discontinuity not following the logical progression. There are digressions, chapters, which seems to be arbitrarily stitched together. The journey remains incomplete, the hero unheroic. So the Marceau investigation takes the form of a long rambling monologue in an Oran bar where wine, forbidden in the Quran, still flows. Daoud's now septuagenarian narrator, Arun, buttonholes his nameless French listener. The story is told in the first person, but there is a lot of second person. Your story, your hero, your language. Turning on the moment in 1942 when he was seven and his older brother, Moussa, was killed in a majestically nonchalant crime in the glaring sun on a deserted Algiers beach. So what I'm interested is the ways in which Arun seeks to find a new language, a nouvelle langue in French. That's the reason he tells us why I've learned to speak this language, the narrator reminds us, so I can speak in the place of a dead man, so I can finish his sentences for him. He's going to, quote, do what was done in this country after independence, take the stones from the old houses the colonists left behind, and build my own house, my own language. So I will stop here because we are running out of time, but uh, what I find important to mention is the ways in which this mobilizes, and this is part of a broader uh, embryonic project, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, which is tentatively called the case against trauma. It mobilizes a different language more generally to speak of trauma, um, a language which goes beyond the, the kind of classic dichotomy that's been put forth over the past 30 years or so about the concepts of trauma and resilience. 
And I'm using the word language as, again, something that's very much translatable and untranslatable. Uh, the ways in which it mobilizes a different set of discursive modes to think with, to think with that which is traumatic. And it seems to me that there have been a number of criticisms of classical trauma theories as they've been put forth, especially in the 1990s and beyond. Um, but looking at this French and Francophone reckoning with uh, its colonial past that's started to happen really in the past 10, 15 years um, is, I think, an interesting lens into this, this tension between self and other. So I will stop here. And there's a lot more to be said about that, about the uses also of French as a literary language, right? A, a language which is not, of course, devoid of history. But I will stop here because I'm not able to take the question and answers. I've added my email address. Um, so if you have any questions, do feel free to email. Thanks very much. We'll now have our final speaker, Dimitros Alexopoulos, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Alabama. Thank you very much. Strangest beings, bioethical reflections on religions and mankind in outer space. At the outset, at the outset, I would like to dedicate my short presentation to Professor Dr. Catherine Denny, Associate Professor at the Department of Anthropology of York, University, Canada. Professor Denning is a Canadian researcher who has written extensively on social and ethical aspects of space exploration, including astrobi astrobiology. Her historical and anthropological approach to the ethics of mankind beyond homeworld has been pivotal in the development of astroethics and astrobioethics, these two newcomers to the great space science family. This presentation is going to discuss strangeness in a cosmic scale, where every human being and every religion of this planet is the other, where everyone and everything becomes a total stranger from start. As the bioethics of religions, this strand of thought will be our primary guide throughout our journey to cosmic bioethical challenges, visions, and dilemmas, that might be of interest to the religions of the globe. Astrobioethics of Religions, ABR in short, is a developing science in search of common ground in outer space among the study of religion, astrobioethics, astrobiology, aerospace, medicine, and advanced biotechnology. This presentation is going, uh, sorry, at, as a space discipline, Astrobioethics of religions originates from the fact that an ever-growing human population from all the socio religious spectrum, not just specialized astro crews, is technologically capable of traveling or residing beyond Earth. ABR thus aspires to create a common language and level of understanding for religions, the space sciences and space technologies industry that might facilitate big investment of resources from communities and social groups up to the present day less eager to follow. Religions and astrobioethics is also a research project based in the National and Capodistrian University of Athens in its ethics and bioethics of religions laboratory. I'm glad that among us today is the director of this laboratory, Assistant Professor Dr. Vasilios Fanaras, whom I deeply thank for his mentorship and support. Humanity, my friends, is no stranger to planet Earth. From an evolutionary perspective, humans have lived in this neighborhood long enough to survive ice ages, modest extinction events, intraspecific competition, 
and harsh climatic conditions. They have been around long enough to cover the, fa cover the face of the earth and establish dominion, albeit fable and frail, over a multitude of organism organisms dwelling on the surface of this planet. Sometime in history, highly organized human communities call them the space powers, and few of their members, call them astronauts and astrocrews, were finally successful in gaining a foothold in what lies beyond the Kármán line, what we call outer space. The same story goes as far as religions are concerned. Religions are no stranger to planetary culture and civilization. The religious element has been present and active in human affairs from times immemorial. In Plutarch's words, traverse the world and you may find towns and cities without walls, without letters, without kings, without houses, without wealth, without money, without theaters and places of exercise. But there was never seen, nor shall be seen by man, any city without temples and gods, without making use of prayers, oaths, divinations, and sacrifices for the obtaining of blessings and benefits and the averting of curses and calamities. In the human timeline, a number of religious communities managed to expand well beyond their historic cradle, outperform or outcast other religious traditions in the process, deflect non-religion proponents, and eventually evolve to world or global religions. With the beginning of the space age, some experiences and practices associated with these global religious traditions gradually found their way to outer space. The religious communities that accepted and maybe embraced humanity's reach for the stars, one might label as religious space powers, acting from here on out in close co cooperation with their political counterparts. It took them 400 million years. And thus, humans and religions found themselves in the starlight. 400 million years have passed since the last big evolutionary leap that drove organic life out of the oceans and onto the continental and aerial saga we live in. For the first time in the recorded history, human beings and religions found themselves in a place of near total strangeness and alterity. The reasons are obvious. First, to the best of our knowledge, there are no humans in space, apart from the one, apart from the few pioneers from Earth. Second, there are no religions in the stars, except for the ones that originate from mankind. Third, the prevailing environmental conditions in most celestial bodies and interstellar space in the known universe are the total antithesis of, two, of human biology and physiology. In the very long term, humans, as we know them at present, could establish a limited activity within the solar system at best. But without a second thought, any plus plans of human hegemonical expanse over the cosmic realm will ever dwell in the land of dreams. Among the finest examples of literary testimony to the effort of looking on the bright and wonderful part of this outer space strangeness is the corpus of the Apollo 11 goodwill messages. It is about a small disc carrying statements by presidents Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon, and messages of goodwill from leaders of 73 countries around the world left on the moon. It is left on the moon, it is right there by the Apollo 11 astronauts. A child of the late 60s, the main denominator of the Apollo 11 goodwill messages is a new call for peace, unity, and prosperity given form thanks to the epic achievement of landing man on the moon. Most of the Apollo goodwill messages texts are short, formulated according to the standard model of diplomatic formality. The Apollo 11 goodwill messages literary corpus gets interesting for, for astrobioethics of religions as close to a quarter of its messages include direct religious references. 
there are Judeo-Christian Christian and Muslim references, allusions to God and the divine in general, even one drawing upon the ancient Greek religion. The religious sensitive texts of the Apollo 11 moon disc are sung by heads of state from the following countries, Belgium, Brazil, Burkina Faso, the Napa Revolta, Cyprus, Ghana, Greece, Iran, Ireland, Israel, Jamaica, Latvia, Liberia, Malta, Mauritius, South Africa, then under the apartheid regime, the Vatican, and Vietnam. There is still much to be researched and received from the Apollo goodwill messages from every perspective, historical, geopolitical, cultural, and socio-anthropological. -socio However, none more can be said right now if we are to respect our tight uh, conference and workshop schedule. Rediscovering the wonderful in the strangest may be the key that will enlighten and empower us on earth as well as beyond our play, pale blue dot. It has been truly a privilege for me to share with you all these brief notes about the common path of humans and religions in the lands of the future. This privilege I owe to professors, Dr. Kirki Kefalea, Dr. Sotirios Despotis, and Dr. Rini Kotsovili, and of course, all the members of this exciting workshops organizing committee. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. And let me conclude with the words of a Canadian prime minister saying to the world through space, man has reached out and touched the tranquil moon. May that high accomplishment allow man to rediscover the earth and find things. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, we are coming to the end. Uh, but I would like to uh, ask you if there are any questions, one or two questions. So, if there are no questions, then um, I would say I would like to say a few words. We are coming to the end of this challenging and productive workshop on Xenos. Time was obviously too short for such a huge complex thematic issue, but at least it gave us food for thought. It was our aim to give impulse and motivation for fertile research to young scholars and build bridges between Greek and Canadian academic participants. Let's hope that this will be the beginning for further academic activities, lectures or online seminars or summer schools in future between the two institutions. Now that we have completed our workshop and before we leave this room, I would like to thank all participants from both sides and all those who worked hard for organizing this workshop especially PhD candidate, Mr. Dimitris Alexopoulos. But also the other members of the organizing committee, my colleagues, uh, Professor Sotiri Despotis, Dr. Apostolos Mikhailidis, And special thanks for the collaboration with Dr. Irini Kotsovili and Dr. James Horkata. <laughs> and now I invite Dr. Irini Kotsovili to provide a short summary and concluding thoughts. Thank you very, very much. I am ever grateful to our presenters for sharing what were excellent presentations, research on this broad and exciting topic. I should point out that some of our presenters have traveled from afar, from Canada, 
Portugal and the Netherlands. So that they can hear Sorbi or the work. The presentations were very thoughtful, engaging, and enjoyable. They were organized in chronological order and themes, taking us from the pre modern world to contemporary times. They trace textual references to the concept of who and what is considered foreign, other. We address what constitutes hospitality, acceptance, and estrangement in Homeric ethics, and how it could serve as a descriptor that can connote a form of political resistance in warring states of China. They also illustrated how one's difference can be embraced by costumes in a multicultural setting in the Mediterranean and the Middle East. Further, our presenters explored attitudes towards the strangers, the foreigners in religious texts, such as in the Gospel of Matthew, and also in non-verbal gestures and acts of recognition or supplication of individuals. In doing so, they offered us the opportunity to immerse ourselves deeper into symbolic interactions within a given belief system with powerful connotations and the formations of identities all in you. The focus of the presentations also included literature, ranging from explorations of the socio-political structure of Greek culture and understandings of belonging to the literary works, to the literary works of important Greek and American writers, in which individual anonymous figures, strangers, are the ones who can observe the failings of societies. What followed were papers centering on the critical and topical issues relating to migration and refugees. We explored policies on migration, as well as narratives of friendship and healing in the aftermath of traumatic historical events, such as the Asia Minor catastrophe. We also addressed mid 20th century philosophical reflections and exiles in members of various diaspora. The final session of our workshop focused on 21st century perspectives on past and future selves. These span on postcolonial retellings of otherness and the power of writing with socio political significance to identify key challenges we are faced with in this day and age to connecting new knowledges with existing frameworks and beliefs. And finally, to contemplating ethical engagement and exploration of new opportunities and sense of belonging in an expanding cosmos. All in all, the presentations offered a rich and diverse exploration of the concept and manifestations of Xenos across time, geographic location, traditions, and text and provided a fascinating glimpse into how we can approach related notions from a variety of perspectives and connections. This is a great food for thought and an invitation for future contemplations, conversations, and collaborations on the topic. In closing, along with my gratitude to our speakers for the thought provoking presentations, I would like to take this opportunity to again thank my fellow organizing committee members for their enthusiasm, their dedication, and hard work as we prepare this workshop. They include Dr. Kefalea, Dr. Despotis, and Dr. Nikairi. Dimitrios Alexopoulos from the Department of Social Theology and Study of Religion, and Dr. Pontasha, my colleague, from the Department of Global Humanities and fellow member of the SNS Center for the Studies at the I would also like to thank our colleagues at the uh, and for their work and uh, ongoing uh, support and appreciation. My appreciation to Julian Sam, Kevin Montgomery, Robert Patti, and the major and Nina Jane for their support. Many, many thanks. Uh, many thanks to all of you. As we wrap up today's workshop, then, with the bless of our closing, uh, closing goodbye, and more of our au revoir. So, next time, as we envision this to be the start of a long and equally productive collaboration between our departments. 
Thank you again for joining us. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Really, thank you very much. And without you, we wouldn't have done it. That's not true, but thank you very much. Now we will give you souvenirs. <laughs> to, to the team from Canada. To the Canadian group. Και για το διαδικτυακό μας κοινό, τώρα θα γίνει διανομή στην ομάδα των φιλοξενούμενών μας από το Πανεπιστήμιο του Καναδά κάποιων αναμνηστικών βιβλίων. Πρόκειται για μια πολύ ωραία έκδοση του Παύλου του Βαλαβάνια για το Μουσείο της Ακρόπολης με την ευγενική χορηγία την ευγενική συνεισφορά των εκδόσεων καπών, τις οποίες ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ για το ευγενικό αυτό εγκύρημα. Don't hide. <laughs> the other amphitheater is for hiding. <laughs> So just as a small token of our appreciation. Professor Crow, do you want to provide that? Well, to the speakers now, uh, to the speakers also. Uh, Professor Crow, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Κύριος Μεντιάρης Βασιλόπουλος. Κυρία Βελίνα Μπέμπεκ. Κυρία Δήμητρα Τούντα. Thank you. 
Κάποιος από τις φυγητές που δεν άκουσε το όνομά του. Είναι οργανική πρεπή, δική. Είναι Να ευχαριστήσω τους αγαπητούς συναδέλφους που ήταν σήμερα εδώ. I want to thank uh, from the bottom of my heart uh, my Greek colleagues who came uh, today, uh, Professor Verdis, Professor Adonopoulos, Professor Manalos, Professor Okay. 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 Είμαστε μπροστά από το για να καταληφθεί το With this, uh, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, we have the end of the proceedings of the International Workshop on Xenos, Xenos in Greek, the stranger, the foreigner, the refugee, which was organized by the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Center for Hellenic Studies of, at the Department of Global Humanities of the Simon Fraser University and uh, the Department of uh, Social Theology and the Study of Religion of the School of Theology of the National Capodistia University of Athens. Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πάρα πολύ που ήσασταν μαζί μας. Βιαζό, Σωστάν Ογκόλα. Νομίζω ότι πετύχαμε ένα πάρα πολύ δύσκολο ρεκόρ το να κατακλειστεί με ζεστούς ανθρώπους αυτή η αίθουσα ημέρα Κυριακή. Ευχαριστούμε και όσοι το παρακολουθήσατε εξ αποστάσεως. Είχε ανακοινωθεί βέβαια ότι η έμφαση θα είναι στη διαζώηση της παρακολούθησης. Να είστε καλά, καλό υπόλοιπο Κυριακής και μείνετε μαζί μας.